welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. First off, a quick announcement. I recently did an interview with my colleague Ben, who hosts the History Voyager podcast. That interview actually went live before the previous episode of Relevant History, but I didn't realize that until my episode was already recorded, so there was no announcement, and I ended up putting a link to the interview in the episode description with absolutely zero context. Ben and I talked about the fall of Rome and some other related subjects, and you can find a link to that chat in the description for this episode. Also, don't forget to leave a review on your favorite podcasting service and share today's episode with your friends. It helps the audience to grow so we can keep doing bigger and better things. And if you want to support the channel financially, you can find a link to the Relevant History Patreon channel in the description as well. Patrons get access to exclusive monthly videos. This is a series called Dan's War College, and to make things more exciting, I've actually gone ahead and made one of those videos available to the public. If you go to the Patreon page, even if you're not a subscriber, Episode 5 of Dan's War College will be visible, so you can get a taste before you subscribe. And if you just want to chat, you can find me on Twitter at at Dan Toller Podcast. That's at Dan, T-O-L-E-R Podcast. Anyway, enough with my shameless self-promotion. Let's get on with the show. Today, I want to talk about one of the most radical changes in national identity in all of history, the Meiji Restoration. This is the 1868 overthrow of the Japanese Tokugawa shogunate and the centralization of power in a rejuvenated Japanese emperor. But it also marks a broader cultural shift from an isolationist, feudal culture to a cosmopolitan, centralized state. Now, obviously, all of these things don't all happen simultaneously in 1868. In fact, the official restoration of the Meiji Emperor happens in the middle of a longer shift. This seismic cultural shift begins in 1853, when an American naval squadron under the command of Commodore Matthew Perry arrives in Tokyo Bay and opens Japan to the world. The shift ends, uh, well, it depends on who you ask when it ends, but if you ask me, this shift ends in 1877 with the Satsuma Rebellion and the defeat of the last samurai army. Even so, we are talking about a period of 24 years, just a fraction of a human lifetime, and the amount of change that happens is remarkable. If this is going to make any sense, we need to talk about the backstory, don't we? we need to talk about what Japan looks like in the middle of the 1800s and why it looks that way. And I'll try to keep it brief, but there's a lot of backstory to understand. To begin with, let's remember that like every other country, a lot of Japan's history has been determined by its geography. And since my audience is mostly Western, it could be helpful to make a comparison to another island nation, Great Britain. Britain is close enough to the rest of Europe that it becomes pollinated with European ideas during the Middle Ages, right? It becomes Christianized, and its leaders engage in European politics. As a matter of fact, before the Christian era, it's part of the Roman Empire, right? But... At the same time, because Britain is an island, the British can disengage from Europe when necessary. For example, during the Napoleonic era, 
Britain is the only country that is consistently able to oppose Napoleon because Napoleon's armies can't get to them. Japan is in a very similar place. It's close enough to China that you get Buddhism and you even get Chinese writing, but it's isolated enough to develop its own culture. And just as Britain can sometimes disengage from the rest of Europe, Japan is free to disengage from the rest of Asia. That's something you can't do if you're the Koreans or the Chinese or the Vietnamese because those people all have land borders to worry about. Another thing to understand is Japan's unusual system of government prior to 1868. Since the Middle Ages, with a few brief exceptions, Japan has been ruled by a shogun or military dictator. But a shogun isn't a dictator in the sense of someone with unlimited personal power. See, the word shogun is actually short for Sai Tai Shogun, which means commander-in-chief of the expeditionary force against the barbarians. It's a military title given by the Japanese emperor to major military leaders. The story of the Japanese emperors would make a fascinating episode in and of itself, They date back to the middle of the first millennium B.C., although most of the early emperors are only known from legends, because the Japanese don't leave any written records until the 700s A.D. when they learn writing from the Chinese. Anyway, the Japanese imperial throne, known as the Chrysanthemum Throne, is an ancient, ancient seat of power. Even today, in the 21st century, Japanese Emperor Naruhito continues the same family line, which makes Japan's imperial family the longest continuous hereditary monarchy in the world. And it isn't even close. And historically, at least in the public eye, the emperor has had an almost godlike status. So, How does Japan come to be ruled by a shogun, by a military dictator? This happens in the late 1100s due to a clash between warring alliances of daimyos. A daimyo is a major Japanese landowner and a member of the nobility. If you're from a Western country, think of the daimyos like medieval European lords, and you won't be far off the mark. Ultimately, one group of daimyos wins control with the backing of the shogun, and the emperor takes on a purely symbolic role in the government. So, the shogun is theoretically subordinate to the emperor, but is effectively ruler of Japan, but... He's also beholden to the leading daimyos, and the daimyos in turn have their own individual armies, much like medieval European lords. Now, here's one place where there's a big, big difference between the Japanese feudal system and the European feudal system. And by the way, there were many different European feudal systems depending on where and when you were living, but we're speaking broadly here. In Europe, A lord's army would consist of a core group of knights, lesser nobility whose sole purpose is to serve in the military. Now, a poor lord might have a couple of knights. A very powerful lord might have dozens of knights if they're the, the prince of Burgundy or something like that. They might even have more. But it's a small, small professional core to the army. And then to supplement this in wartime, you will typically conscript a bunch of peasants to fill out the ranks. And then later on, the Europeans start using mercenaries. And you know, it's only in the you know, early modern period that you start seeing uh, consistent use of professional armies. 
That's later on. In the Japanese feudal system, on the other hand, uh, the commoners are strictly forbidden from carrying weapons. So you don't have this giant base of peasants you can just conscript. Instead, the military consists of the samurai class. These are lesser nobility, similar in that sense to European knights, but there are a lot more of them. They're a larger percentage of the society. And because there are so many of them, uh, this gives the samurai clout as a socio-political class in and of themselves which is not the case for the European knightly class. And the shogunate provides stability for Japan. Between 1185 and 1868, there are only two major periods of unrest. It's a pretty good track record over a 700-year period. And that's not to say there's no war. Daimyos go to war against other daimyos all the time. Sometimes there are wars with outside powers. There are political assassinations and intrigues and all the things you'd expect in any complex political system. But for the most part, the shoguns are able to keep control of the situation to maintain the backing of enough daimyos to keep a unified government and defend Japan against incursions from outside powers. Everybody, or at least all of the higher-ranking people in this system, everybody gets something they want. The emperors in the imperial family get a posh life in Kyoto with all the luxuries that only one of the world's great cities can offer. The daimyos get to collect rent on their lands, run their own little wars and plots against other daimyos, and enjoy a good quality of living in their castles. The samurai hold a respected place in society, and they have plenty of political power as a group. And while the common people don't exactly have a high standard of living, it's comparable to people in the nicer parts of Europe during the late medieval and renaissance periods, right? They're poor, and they may even go hungry during hard times, but there are also good times. And there are nice things like green tea and sake and playing games of go with your friends. There are also plenty of holidays and festivals to take a break from the daily grind. And I think a lot of modern historical works... Uh, at least pop history, uh, tends to over-exaggerate how bad conditions were for average people in these times. And we forget that our high modern standards of living are a recent phenomenon. And we don't give our ancestors enough credit for finding ways to enjoy themselves and make life more tolerable. And... Again, all of these things I'm saying are broad generalizations because we're talking about an almost 700-year period, and a lot of things happen in that time. From a narrative perspective, the first real story I want to talk about begins in the year 1603, and... That is the year that Tokugawa Ieyasu takes power. This is at the end of one of those periods of unrest we talked about. This period of unrest, called the Sengoku period, has lasted for more than a hundred years. Essentially, there has been a series of weak puppet shoguns and an endless series of civil wars and there hasn't even been a shogun at all since 1573. Now, Tokugawa Ieyasu first comes to prominence in the 1560s. He is a vassal of Oda Nobunaga, who is one of the participants in the civil wars, 
and becomes the first warlord to unify Japan since the beginning of the Sengoku period. And everybody thinks he is about to become the next shogun, and a strong one. But before Oda Nobunaga can finish mopping up the last of his rivals and actually claim the title, he is betrayed and assassinated by one of his vassals in 1582. And this kicks off another round of civil wars. At this point, Tokugawa Ieyasu has become quite powerful in his own right as one of Oda Nobunaga's leading generals. And now uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu is fighting for power with a man named Toyotome Hideyoshi. But after almost a year of fighting, neither side is able to gain an advantage, so they agree to be friends with Toyotomi Hideyoshi asking as the senior partner. Over the next few years, Toyotomi eliminates the rest of his significant rivals and becomes the second of Japan's great unifiers. And a word about naming conventions here. In Japan, the family name is first and the given name is second. So Toyotomi Hideyoshi is Hideyoshi of the Toyotomi family. Anyway, Toyotomi manages to keep Japan united mostly by launching two invasions of Korea. He is never named Shogun, but these invasions do keep the daimyos busy and keep them fighting from fighting each other. In the first invasion of Korea, in 1592-1593, Japanese troops are initially successful until the Koreans call on their overlords, the Ming Dynasty, for help. Japanese armies actually defeat the Chinese troops in a major battle outside the city of Seoul, but it ultimately doesn't matter because the Japanese naval fleet is defeated, so they can't resupply and they have to negotiate with the Ming. There's a short truce, and then Toyotomi tries to invade Korea again, and it goes pretty much the same way. In one famous incident at the Battle of Myongyang, a Korean force of only 13 ships defeats a Japanese fleet of 133 warships and 200 transports, sinking 30 of the warships and killing around half of the Japanese soldiers. And as much as I want to tell that story, I'm going to exercise some restraint. Because today's episode is about Japan, and one of these days I'm going to want to talk about Korea and the Battle of Myongyang, is one of their most famous national stories. After the battle, Toyotomi's troops are once again stranded in Korea, and morale is low. But before he can negotiate another truce, Toyotomi dies of a fever in September of 1598, which once again leaves Japanese unity in question. Toyotomi knows he's dying, and on his deathbed, he summons his most trusted friends to try and ensure domestic peace. One of those friends is Tokugawa Ieyasu. What has Tokugawa been up to all this time? In the 1580s, after agreeing to friendship with Toyotomi, he first helps Toyotomi subdue his rivals in Kyushu, which is the southernmost of the four main Japanese islands. After that, he relocates his family to Edo, which is a castle and a small fishing village on the southeast coast of the main island of Honshu. And he starts to develop the area into a small city. In 1593, Toyotomi summons Tokugawa to Kyushu 
to take command of some troops for the Korean campaign, but these are reserve troops, and while Tokugawa Ieyasu spends the next five years splitting his time between Edo and Kyushu, he never actually leads these troops in combat. Now, Edo is in a remote area of Japan at this time, and it's somewhat underdeveloped, but Tokugawa's vassals continue developing it while he's in Kyushu. See, Tokugawa has chosen to relocate to Edo precisely because it's somewhat of a backwater. In this more remote location, his vassals are relatively isolated from daimyo politics, and he's able to keep them busy uh, productively and slowly build up his strength. When Toyotomi Hideyoshi is on his deathbed in 1598, he names what he calls the Council of Five Elders to administer the country, and Tokugawa Ieyasu is on that council. And because he's been building up his strength all this time, he is the most powerful man on that council. Right, the council's first act after Toyotomi's death is to quietly recall all of their soldiers from Korea without announcing Toyotomi's passing first. I don't want to give the Chinese any edge in the peace negotiations, and then they negotiate another truce with China, but after that, the Council of Five Elders doesn't rule for long. See, one of the other counselors, a daimyo named Maeda Toshii, uh, he dies in 1599, which reduces the council to four. Meanwhile, Tokugawa Ieyasu sends an army to occupy Osaka Castle, which had been Toyotomi's place of residence. And at this, uh, the other three members of the council are outraged. It looks like Tokugawa Ieyasu is trying to seize supreme power. Well, he is. And the other three members of the council choose a daimyo named Ishida Mitsunari as their choice of leader. He's supposed to be a unifying choice because while he is a major daimyo, he is not a council member. So he's supposedly this neutral arbiter between everybody. But the situation devolves into a civil war, and Ishida's western army and Tokugawa's eastern army seize some of each other's castles, engage in some preliminary skirmishes, and then the two main armies face off an open battle on October 21st, 1600. In this battle the Battle of Sakigahara, Ishida's force outnumbers Tokugawa's 120,000 to 75,000. But Tokugawa has been using diplomacy and spycraft, and prior to the battle, he has bribed a number of Ishida's daimyos with promises of money and power. And so during the fight several of Ishida's allies switch sides and join the Tokugawa force and turn against their former allies. Even so, the battle lasts almost all day. Thousands of men are killed by some accounts, tens of thousands on Ishida's side. The Japanese have arquebuses and muskets by this time, and their muskets are actually better in some respects than contemporary European models. So this is a gunpowder fight, as well as being fought with swords and arrows. And by the end of the day, Tokugawa Ieyasu is victorious. Ishida Mitsunari is captured and beheaded, 
Daimyos who had remained faithful to him have their land seized, are relocated, or otherwise punished, and Tokugawa Ieyasu is the undisputed ruler of Japan. Three years later, in 1603, the emperor will formally recognize Tokugawa as shogun, the first man to hold the title in 30 years, and the first since 1467 to hold real power over the empire. But he still has enemies, former supporters of Ishida, who are now backing Toyotomi Hideyori, who is the late Toyotomi Hideyoshi's heir. And while the plotters are doing this quietly in the shadows, Tokugawa Ieyasu worries about assassins. So he abdicates as shogun, leaving the position to his son, Tokugawa Hidetada. This allows Tokugawa Ieyasu to, to continue ruling through his son, but personally remain in the shadows. Right. Over the next several years, he expands Edo Castle, making it into the largest in all of Japan, while ensuring that his daimyos foot the entire bill. Then, he moves in to eliminate the last of his rivals. In 1614, he puts Osaka Castle under siege, with Toyotomi Hideyori inside. In 1615, his men finally storm the castle, and Tokugawa forces Hideyori and the remaining members of the Toyotomi family to commit seppuku, the ritual suicide performed by slitting of the belly. Those who refuse to do so are killed anyway. And Tokugawa Ieyasu seems to feel deep remorse for killing the family of his dead friend and overlord. According to legend, he does penance by writing out the name of the Buddha 10,000 times on a roll of parchment, but he also seems to feel as if this were a necessary evil, that he had to destroy any potential rival to ensure stability in Japan. Indeed, it ensures the dominance of the Tokugawa family, uh, ensuring that the Tokugawa shogunate will remain unopposed in Japan for the foreseeable future. But... In 1614, the same year that uh, he puts Osaka Castle under siege, uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu does something else that's equally significant. He signs an edict expelling all Christians from Japan and banning the presence of foreign missionaries. See, Portuguese Jesuits have long maintained a presence in Nagasaki, and a significant portion of the local population, as well as other people in Japan, have converted to Christianity. And Tokugawa fears that these Christians will be opposed to the traditional Japanese way of life and class structure. That fear is probably overblown, since Europe is the hotbed of Christianity at this time, and the Europeans have their own fairly rigid class structures. But Tokugawa's fears of novel religions, that in and of itself is not entirely unfounded. See, other Japanese leaders in very recent times have had to put down homegrown religious movements that opposed the feudal system. So, when he sees any religion that is not traditionally Japanese, it makes sense that uh, Tokugawa would want to shut that down. The Japanese have also had contact with the Spanish, the Dutch, and the English at this time, not just the Portuguese. Remember, the uh, 
Japanese are an island nation. They have a strong maritime tradition for trading and all that. As a matter of fact, there's even a major Dutch trading outpost in Nagasaki that Tokugawa allows to remain. But at the same time, he is not taking any chances with these Christian missionaries, and he's a little bit alarmed by the behavior of some of these European countries. Spain just recently has conquered the Philippines, which is right in Japan's backyard, and Tokugawa wants to make it very clear that Japan's land belongs to the Japanese and not to anyone else, especially not to Europeans, who the Japanese call the Southern Barbarians, since their ships arrive from the south. Tokugawa Ieyasu dies a couple of years later, in 1616. But his heirs continue to expand upon his policies of isolation. Ieyasu's grandson, Tokugawa Iemitsu, goes much further in his crackdown on European influence. While he continues to allow the single Dutch trading post to remain... Traders are now restricted to an island in Nagasaki Harbor. This island is linked to the mainland by a single bridge, and no Dutch traders are allowed to cross that bridge, and the only Japanese allowed to cross over to the Dutch island are those merchants who are specifically involved with the Dutch trade. Tokugawa Iemitsu also continues to allow trade with the Chinese, although they too are now restricted to the port city of Nagasaki. Traders in the northern island of Hokkaido are allowed to trade with the Ainu people who are native to the area, and traders on the southern island of Kyushu are allowed to trade with the Ryukyu Kingdom, which is a tributary state of Japan at this time, and rules over the Ryukyu Islands, including Okinawa. And a lot of Chinese trade flows through the Ryukyu Kingdom as well. Uh, trade is still open to Korean merchants at designated ports. But the only other powers who are allowed to trade with Japan are the Portuguese, although they are not allowed to maintain any presence on the shore. And then a few years later, in 1635, Tokugawa Iemitsu goes even further. He issues a series of orders that some people call the Sokoku Edict. The Japanese word Sokoku means locked country. And that's what people now call the policies of the Tokugawa shogunate from this time forward. But Tokugawa Iemitsu himself didn't call his orders the Sokoku Edict, nor was it a general edict. It was a legal memorandum to magistrates in the trading city of Nagasaki. Even so, because it becomes a legal precedent... The so-called Sokoku Edict is historically significant, and it's worth reading a little bit of it. The following translation is taken from the book Voices of Early Modern Japan, written by American historian Constantine Nomikos Vaporis. Here are a few of the first points of Tokugawa Iemitsu's memorandum to the Nagasaki magistrates. Quote, 1. It is strictly prohibited for Japanese ships to leave for foreign countries. 2. Japanese are prohibited from going abroad. If a Japanese goes abroad in secret, he will be put to death. The ship that transported him must be impounded, its owner arrested, and the matter reported to the authorities. 3. If any Japanese returns home after residing abroad, he must be put to death. 4. If there is any place where the teachings of the Padres, Christianity, is practiced, 
The two of you must order a thorough investigation. 5. Any informer who reveals the whereabouts of the followers of Padres must be rewarded. If anyone reveals the whereabouts of a high-ranking Padre, he must be given 100 pieces of silver. For those of lower ranks, the reward must be set accordingly. 6. If a foreign ship has objections to the edicts and it becomes necessary to report the matter to Edo, you may ask the officials of Omura Domain to provide ships to guard the foreign vessel, as was done previously. 7. If there are any southern barbarians who spread the teachings of the Padres or otherwise commit crimes, they may be locked up in the prison maintained by Omura Domain, as was done previously. 8. All incoming ships must be carefully searched for the followers of Padres. 9. No single trading city shall be permitted to purchase all the merchandise brought by foreign ships. 10. Samurai are not permitted to purchase any goods originating from foreign ships directly from Chinese merchants in Nagasaki. Unquote. Now, there are several more points in Tokugawa Iemitsu's memorandum, but they're all about port logistics and the market price of undyed yarn. But these first ten points outline the lengths to which the shogunate is willing to keep Christianity out of the country. And even more broadly, just any kind of foreign influence, right? It's interesting to note that they don't want samurai trading directly, even with the Chinese. Can't have too much foreign influence, it seems, even from your East Asian neighbors. And in 1639, Tokugawa Iemitsu issues yet another edict, see? Apparently, the Portuguese have continued to try and sneak missionaries into the country, so he's going to cut them off as well. Drawing from Vaporis' translation, quote, The proscription of Christianity is known to the Portuguese, but heretofore they have secretly transported those who are going to propagate that religion. Two, if those who believe in that religion band together in an attempt to do evil things, they must be subjected to punishment. 3. While those who believe in the preachings of the priests are in hiding, there are incidents in which that country has sent gifts to them for their sustenance. In view of the above, hereafter, entry by the Portuguese Galeota is forbidden. If they insist on coming, the ships must be destroyed and anyone aboard those ships must be beheaded. Unquote. So, the Portuguese trade is also banned, and there is a myth that Japan loses out on trade at this point, but that's not accurate at all. Number one, they're still trading with the Chinese and the Koreans, right, and their local neighbors, the Ainu and the Ryukyu people. They still have that local Asian trade, and they don't even suffer a reduction in European trade at all. See, prior to banning Portuguese trade, Tokugawa Iemitsu has already secretly negotiated with the Dutch for them to just send more ships to make up the balance in European trade. So the shogunate loses nothing but a few Jesuit missionaries. The Dutch, it seems, are the only Europeans who aren't interested in sending missionaries to Japan. And for over 200 years, they remain Japan's only European trading partner. Now, this seems to be intended as a temporary measure. To allow Japan a little bit of breathing room after a few generations of internal turmoil. Indeed, this Sokoku, this policy of isolation, it leads to a long period of peace inside of Japan. And because Japan's only relations with any other countries are restricted to trade, uh, 
they don't get dragged into any foreign wars either. So I don't mean to write off the Sokoku policies. Uh, to begin with, Japan is one of the very few places on the globe that never gets colonized by a European power. There is no British Japan or Spanish Japan. There is only ever Japan. And that alone tells us that there was at least some wisdom to these policies. And there are also cultural benefits. During this period of peace and tranquility, uh, domestically, uh, art and literature are flourishing in Japan. And this period, uh, called the Edo period, uh, because Japan is ruled from the Tokugawa capital in Edo, uh, this Edo period gives us some of the greatest Japanese art and literature of all time. And during this time, by the way, Japanese literacy rates right through the mid-1800s are comparable to those in the more educated countries in Europe, right? Far ahead of most of the rest of the world. And so the Japanese people... Even many of the common people are reading this literature. And Japan also manages to keep pace with scientific knowledge. Dutch traders bring maps and globes with the latest geographic knowledge, right? This is the age of exploration. Stuff is being discovered all the time. And the Japanese are finding out about things like the geographic details of the New World, uh, not long after the Europeans are hearing about it. The Dutch also bring things like medical textbooks and other scientific works, and many Japanese scholars are fluent in Dutch, so they can read all of these things. And I want you to remember that, because the high Japanese literacy rates and their educated populace are a big part of what helps them get out of this funk. And what I mean by funk is that while Japan is producing all of this wonderful artwork and literature and is experiencing a very peaceful period, Japan is also beginning to lag behind other countries in technology. And there are a couple of knock-on effects that make things worse. First, because Japan is heavily reliant on imports, they start to run into some cash flow problems. And in the 1700s, there is a shortage of gold and silver. To compensate, the shogunate encourages domestic production of silk and ginseng, which are some of the most expensive imports. Uh, but this further limits trade with China, right? because they're not buying as much silk and ginseng from there. There are fewer Chinese merchants coming into the country. Uh, therefore, there is less cultural and scientific interchange than there was uh, just a few years earlier, even with Japan's closest trading partner. Second, instead of changing with the times... Later shoguns come to regard Sokoku as ancestral law. In the West, the American and French revolutions come and pass, and most of Western Europe liberalizes. The old colonial empires ease up on their emphasis of religious conversion and lean further into trade and commerce you'd think that the shogunate would recognize this as an opportunity, but they're so busy looking inward that they don't even notice that the rest of the world is changing. And truth be told, there are too many daimyo and samurai profiting from the old feudal system for change to really be a palatable thing. Liberalization is great if you're a peasant or a merchant, but it's not so appealing if you're part of the old ruling class. Third, and most ominously, technology starts to leave the Japanese behind. 
In the 1600s, Japanese technology outpaced European technology in many respects. A war between a major European power and Japan would have been a very close thing, and the outcome would have come down to luck and leadership. Certainly, on their own turf, the Japanese under Tokugawa Ieyasu would have wiped the floor with any colonial power that tried to take any of their land. But by the middle of the 1800s, Japan has been isolated for more than 200 years, and their technology is starting to look just a little bit out of date. During the Edo period, the shogun himself slowly becomes weaker and weaker, and by the late Edo period, most decisions are made by local daimyos. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. With the land at peace and external contact strictly limited, there's not much practical purpose for a supreme military commander. But this means that there's no strong central state to conduct foreign policy. And some in Japan are already of the opinion that a foreign policy is going to be necessary. There are rumblings in the late Edo period, little incidents around the periphery where Japan's veil of secrecy is starting to come undone. The first of these incidents happens in 1808. The Napoleonic Wars are raging in Europe, and Napoleon has annexed the Dutch Republic and seized control of Dutch merchant trade. The British, who are Napoleon's bitter enemies, respond by attacking Dutch trade throughout the world. On the 4th of October, the HMS Phaeton, under the command of Royal Navy Captain Fleetwood Pellew, sails into Nagasaki Harbor, flying a Dutch flag. Dutch traders row out to meet this fake Dutch ship from their enclave island of Dejima, and Pelu takes them hostage. He demands to know when the Dutch trading ships are scheduled to arrive, and he demands supplies from the Japanese harbor master in exchange for their release. And there's little the local magistrates can do. The Phaeton is a large frigate with 48 guns of the most modern design. The defenses of Nagasaki Harbor, on the other hand, are woefully out of date. The cannons are centuries old and most of them don't even fire. The local garrison only has a hundred men, so the magistrate, a guy named Matsudaira Yasuhiti, he has to call in troops from the surrounding area, and it's going to take them time to arrive. So in the meantime, he's forced to give in to Pelu's demands and send supplies over to the Phaeton. Pelu learns from the Dutch traders that no Dutch merchant ships are actually expected this year due to the war. So he lets them go and he sails out of the harbor before Japanese reinforcements can arrive. And poor Matsudaira, the local magistrate, takes personal responsibility for the incident and commits seppuku. In response to this incident, the shogunate orders the coastal defenses to be upgraded and commands that any foreign ships, except for the Dutch, are to be fired upon as soon as they are sighted. In addition, the shogunate encourages the study of English and Russian, as well as Dutch, so you can see a bit of conflict in their policies. On the one hand, Japan is a highly literate nation that wants to modernize, and you can't keep up with science and technology when you're a hermit kingdom. On the other hand, Japan is terrified of colonization. 
Even mighty China loses a war to Great Britain in 1842 and is forced to hand over the city of Hong Kong. China has been the most powerful nation in the world through most of human history, and even the Middle Kingdom is no match for these European colonial powers. So during this period, now in the early to mid-1800s, there is a divide among the Japanese daimyos. Some are of the opinion that Japan needs to open up for trade and do it now. The Industrial Revolution is beginning, and if Japan is going to keep up with these colonial powers, she needs all of the benefits of trade and commerce. The other main faction is of the opposite opinion. These colonial powers are dangerous, and if we let them trade with us, then they'll just send more ships, and then their people will start settling here, and then sooner or later we'll end up like the Philippines under the control of an outside power. There is a Japanese poem written in 1818 that sums up this feeling. It reads, quote, The barbarian heart is hard to fathom. The throne ponders and dares not relax its armed defense. Alas, wretches, why come they to vex our anxious eyes, pursuing countless miles in their greed? Crawling like gigantic ants after rancid flesh, do we not trade our most lovely jewels for thorns? Unquote. This is the political environment when the Tokugawa shogunate and the United States first come into contact. Now, at this period in time, the United States is going through its own existential crisis. The tension between free states and slave states is simmering, and the nation is headed down the road towards civil war. But... American merchants are also starting to spread their way across the Pacific, and it's inevitable that they're going to show up in Japan. In 1837, an American merchant ship called the Morrison, under command of a businessman named Charles King, sets off from Macau. King's real motivations seem to be to establish some type of trade with Japan, but ostensibly this is a goodwill mission. The ship is unarmed, and it's carrying seven shipwrecked Japanese people who want to return home even though they risk facing the death penalty for such a return. One of these castaways, Yamamoto Ochikichi, has a fascinating story in his own right. Yamamoto is only 20 years old, but when he was 15, the rice transport he was sailing on was damaged in a storm and got blown all the way across the Pacific to modern-day Washington State. He was found, along with two other survivors, and enslaved by local tribes, who ultimately handed them over to the British Hudson Bay Company, who sent him back to England. There, the company tried to convince the Crown to use Yamamoto and the others to convince Japan to trade, but the Crown declined and had them sent to Macau so they could hopefully be repatriated. So this poor guy has already been shipwrecked, enslaved, freed, and used as a political pawn. He's been all the way around the world, he just wants to get home, and that's how he ends up on the Morrison under the command of Charles King, once again being used as a political pawn. The Morrison sails first into Edo Bay, and the coastal batteries immediately open fire. King has the ship drop anchor outside of their range, and some local fishermen come aboard and share food and sake. But in the morning, The crew and the Japanese castaways awaken once again under cannon fire. Seems that overnight, the local garrison moved the cannons closer to shore and into range of the ship. So, King has the Morrison stale 
down to the island of Kyushu and tries to make contact there. He initially does talk with some local officials and hands over two of the Japanese castaways. But the next morning, a local fisherman warns King to leave immediately. His crew barely has time to strike their sails before they come under fire from cannons that have been moved into range, just like what happened at Edo. So, King returns to China without success. And if you're wondering about Yamamoto Otokichi, this is actually where his life takes a turn for the better. He ends up getting married and settling in Shanghai, where he works for a British trading company and is apparently pretty successful. He later becomes a naturalized British subject and serves as a translator for two major British diplomatic missions to Japan in his later years, after the country is opened. In his later years, he moves to Singapore, where he fathers four children and runs a significant trading operation of his own. So, not all of this was bad for Yamamoto Otokichi, but for the United States government, the Morrison incident has a slightly different meaning. It means that it will not be sufficient to open contact with Japan through private channels. It's time for the government to take official action. The next contact between America and Japan comes in early 1846. Late in 1845, U.S. Commodore James Biddle had visited China to finalize the Treaty of Wang He. And this was a peace and free trade agreement between the U.S. and the Qing Dynasty. And now, as he's on his way back to the U.S., Biddle sails into Edo Bay with two warships to try and make contact with the Japanese. By now, the shogunate has stopped shooting foreign ships on sight, but Biddle's delegation is still not allowed to land. And after handing over his message, he is forced to wait for anchor for days before he finally receives a response. And as he boards the Japanese ambassador's ship, one of the samurai guards shoves him to the deck, and he returns to his own ship, and the Japanese apologize, but their response is the same as it's always been. Trade is closed to all but the Dutch, and the Americans are asked to leave. In 1849, the Americans and the Japanese come into contact again. See, 18 American sailors from a whaling vessel have been shipwrecked in Japan, and the Dutch have informed the American government that these sailors are being held in prison in Nagasaki. Commander James Glynn is dispatched with a small U.S. Navy ship to negotiate. The Japanese block the harbor with small boats, but he forces his ship through and refuses to leave until the prisoners are released. He even at one point threatens a wider U.S. military intervention should those sailors not be turned over. And turn the sailors over, the Japanese do, and Glynn goes home. And in his report, he strongly recommends making a show of force as part of any future negotiations. Now, at this point in the story, it's worth considering why the United States would have so much of an interest in Japan. Well, why not turn to the primary source on the matter? In 1852... U.S. President Millard Fillmore writes a letter to the Emperor of Japan, and it outlines the American case for free trade. And he dispatches Commodore Matthew Perry, a senior U.S. naval officer, to deliver this letter. So before we talk about Commodore Perry and his expedition, let's read what Millard Fillmore has to say. He writes, quote, 
Millard Fillmore, President of the United States of America, to His Imperial Majesty, the Emperor of Japan, great and good friend. I send you this public letter by Commodore Matthew C. Perry, an officer of the highest rank in the Navy of the United States and commander of the squadron now visiting your Imperial Majesty's dominions. I have directed Commodore Perry to assure your Imperial Majesty that I entertain the kindest feelings towards your Majesty's person and government, and that I have no other object in sending him to Japan but to propose to your Imperial Majesty that the United States and Japan should live in friendship and have commercial intercourse with each other. The Constitution and Laws of the United States forbid all interference with the religious or political concerns of other nations. I have particularly charged Commodore Perry to abstain from every act which could possibly disturb the tranquility of your Imperial Majesty's dominions. The United States of America reach from ocean to ocean, and our territory of Oregon and state of California lie directly opposite to the domains of your Imperial Majesty. Our steamships can go from California to Japan in 18 days. Our great state of California produces about 60 millions of dollars in gold every year, besides silver, quicksilver, precious stones, and many other valuable articles. Japan is also a rich and fertile country and produces many very valuable articles. Your Imperial Majesty's subjects are skilled in many of the arts, I am desirous that our two countries should trade with each other, for the benefit both of Japan and the United States. We know that the ancient laws of your Imperial Majesty's government do not allow of foreign trade, except with the Chinese and the Dutch. But as the state of the world changes and new governments are formed, it seems to be wise from time to time to make new laws. There was a time when the ancient laws of your Imperial Majesty's government were first made. About the same time, America, which is sometimes called the New World, was first discovered and settled by the Europeans. For a long time, there were but a few people, and they were poor. They have now become quite numerous. Their commerce is very extensive, and they think that if your imperial majesty were so far to change the ancient laws as to allow a free trade between the two countries, it would be extremely beneficial to both. If your imperial majesty is not satisfied that it would be safe altogether to abrogate the ancient laws which forbid foreign trade, they might be suspended for five or ten years so as to try the experiment. If it does not prove beneficial as was hoped, the ancient laws can be restored. The United States often limit their treaties with foreign states to a few years, and then renew them or not, as they please. I have directed Commodore Perry to mention another thing to your Imperial Majesty. Many of our ships pass every year from California to China, and a great number of our people pursue the whale fishery near the shores of Japan. It sometimes happens, in stormy weather, that one of our ships is wrecked on your Imperial Majesty's shores. In all such cases, we ask and expect that our unfortunate people should be treated with kindness and that their property should be protected till we can send a vessel and bring them away. We are very much in earnest in this. Commodore Perry is also directed by me to represent to your Imperial Majesty that we understand that there is a great abundance of coal and provisions in the Empire of Japan. Our steamships, in crossing the great ocean, burn a great deal of coal, and it is not convenient to bring it all the way from America. We wish that our steamships and other vessels should be allowed to stop in Japan and supply themselves with coal, provisions, and water. They will pay for them in money, or in anything else your Imperial Majesty's subjects may prefer. And we request your Imperial Majesty to appoint a convenient port in the southern part of the Empire where our vessels may stop for this purpose. We are very desirous of this. These are the only objects for which I have sent Commodore Perry, with a powerful squadron, to pay a visit to your Imperial Majesty's renowned city of Edo. Friendship, commerce, a supply of coal and provisions, and protection for our shipwrecked people. 
we have directed Commodore Perry to beg your Imperial Majesty's acceptance of a few presents. They are of no great value in themselves, but some of them may serve as specimens of the articles manufactured in the United States, and they are intended as tokens of our sincere and respectful friendship. May the Almighty have your Imperial Majesty in his great and holy keeping. In witness whereof, I have caused the great seal of the United States to be hereunto affixed, and have subscribed the same with my name at the city of Washington, in America, the seat of my government, on the thirteenth day of the month of November, in the year 1852. Your good friend, Millard Fillmore, President. Unquote. It seems like a reasonable proposal, doesn't it? You've got coal, and we'd like to buy some. We'll gladly buy other things, too, and can you please not imprison our shipwrecked sailors? You'll also note that Millard Fillmore reassures the Emperor that the U.S. has no religious aims in Japan. He seems to be aware of Japanese concerns. But what happens next is a crash course in speaking softly and carrying a big stick. See, when Millard Fillmore sends Commodore Perry to Japan, he sends him with some of America's most powerful warships. And this is important because Millard Fillmore is a lawyer by profession. He's trying to reason with the Japanese. But Commodore Matthew Perry is a military man, and he intends to make a show of force, and he's going to combine a little bit of intimidation with Fillmore's logical appeal. Now, in 1852, the U.S. is a third-rate power, if that. Uh, it hardly has any army at all, but... The U.S. Navy has always been well-funded, and while the American fleet at this time is tiny compared to the British or French fleets, the ships the Americans do have are quite good. Commodore Perry doesn't sail into Edo Bay. He steams his way in. Of his four ships... Three are paddle-wheel frigates. These look quaint to modern eyes. Uh, think of a riverboat casino with a big paddle wheel on the side, but make it into a much bigger ocean-going vessel. To the people of the middle 1800s, though, a paddle-wheel frigate is anything but quaint. This is the latest in naval technology, with a top speed of ten knots. And alongside the main mast, there is a big smokestack releasing a plume of black smoke. And the first Japanese people to see these ships, steaming into Edo Bay in the afternoon of July 8, 1853, are fishermen. See, Edo is a big city by now, but it's several miles upriver from the bay, and the Perry expedition is arriving at a smaller city called Uraga. Uraga acts as an inspection point for domestic Japanese commerce to and from Edo, but most of the people there are fishermen. Understand that these fishermen have never seen anything like this. The Japanese themselves are forbidden from building anything bigger than coastal ships, and previous Western and Chinese traders have always come in sailing ships. This is something entirely new, this steamship, and it's unsettling. But throughout the afternoon, more and more people set out in boats into Edo Bay to get a closer look at what they are calling the black ships. 
local soldiers sail out to warn off the Americans. On one boat, they hoist a banner in French telling the Americans to leave. But the Americans don't leave. Several boats attempt to board the American ships, but the Americans push them away. And a messenger is finally sent out to see what these new arrivals want. Perry refuses to meet with the messenger. and He sends out a subordinate to meet with the messenger instead. He says that he is carrying a message for the emperor from the U.S. president, and he will only meet with the highest-ranking person in the city. Later on, an American ship will even fire a cannonade over Edo Bay, which Perry says is a salute, but it's not too hard to read between the lines here, is it? Perry is showing the Japanese that he's heavily armed, and that they'd better think twice about launching any kind of attack or ambush. That evening, the mayor of Uraga comes out to meet with Perry, and to convince Perry that he's the highest-ranking person in town, he actually calls himself the Lord of Uraga, which is a bit of an inflation, but it works. And he and Perry meet, and Perry says that he's carrying an official letter to the Emperor, and he asks the Lord of Uraga if he can deliver it. Well, the mayor of Uraga says that he doesn't have sufficient rank, but he can send a messenger upriver to Edo to inform the court of Perry's mission. Perry asks how long it will take to get a response, and he agrees to wait for three days for an answer but he follows up with a threat. If he does not get a response, he will take his fleet upriver to Edo, land his marines, and deliver the letter in person. During the next few days, both sides engage in what today we would call psychological warfare. Perry steams his fleet around Edo Bay and even goes a few miles upriver at one point, blowing his ship's loud steam whistles and terrifying the locals. He also does practical things like sounding various parts of the bay for depth to create an accurate nautical chart. Meanwhile, the Japanese are preparing a reception hall for the American delegation and they're building it near where the American ships are anchored, and they put their carpenters to work at night, so there's a lot of hammering, and it makes it hard for the Americans to sleep. So, how does this American diplomacy in force impact the people in Japan, both locally and throughout the empire? How do they react? I will draw here from American journalist George Pfeiffer's book, Breaking Open Japan, Commodore Perry, Lord Abe, and American Imperialism in 1853. This book uses a lot of subquotes, which have some a slightly outdated language, so bear that in mind as we move ahead. But in his book, Pfeiffer describes a weird mixture of old-school racial prejudice and a fear of Western military might. If this is not panic, it's the next thing to it. He describes a wave of public reactions rippling out from the city of Uraga. He writes, quote, The collection of a hundred-odd wood and paper buildings was 27 miles south of the virtually undefended capital, which Perry would soon find quite certain can be destroyed by a few steamers of very light draft and carrying guns of the heaviest caliber. Local people trembled without knowing such details, while most Americans with an interest in Orientals 
were convinced of the backwards, treacherous, and rapacious Japanese also excelled in cruelty, Japan's use of barbarian wasn't necessarily contemptuous. It had borrowed the term from China, where, as in ancient Greece, it could denote simply all who lived beyond the borders of their own higher civilization, and barbard, babbled, in another tongue. In that sense, barbarians in far-off places wasn't always a derogatory allusion to primitive tribes. However, dark overtones usually sounded to people convinced of their own uniqueness, more as in the Roman fear of enemies at the gate. A government advisor saw foreign script, confused and irregular, wiggling like snakes or larvae of mosquitoes, as symbolic of the difference between the depraved West and the elegant East. The ugly letters also reminded him of worms, dog's teeth, slime lines left by snails, decaying skulls, and parched vipers' rotten bellies. Most people who lived within the borders of the land favored by heaven and a divine emperor did consider outsiders culturally and morally inferior. Some thought they were beasts that merely look human. Or not even that, as with the furry ones thought to live in trees. A prominent thinker of the time maintained that while his people, down to the most humble, were descended from gods, Westerners were more like animals. The farmers and fishing people who comprised 80 or so percent of the population got their every impression of life abroad from folklore that had made Christians scary ever since the country's 17th century closing, although contradictory tales told of divinities coming from across the seas. Luridly illustrated legends described demon-like monsters with bulbous or beaked noses and claws for hands. Thus, popular denigrations such as hairy foreigners and red hairs were sometimes used half-jokingly, but more often than not by people who dreaded them as alien to the species as well as to Japan. Those creatures killed animals. Animals for food. When Perry would ask to buy 60 heads of cattle for his squadron, puzzled native officials wondered what on earth he intended to do with them. The Commodore's reply, why, eat them, of course, prompted disgust. We can never comply with your cruel wishes to kill and eat such animals. Never mind the Japanese slaughters of human beings, including Mongol survivors of Kublai Khan's invasion fleet, destroyed by the divine winds and appalling numbers of domestic enemies during past civil wars. Westerners were rumored to devour carcasses whole, even if they left some larger bones unconsumed, the stench of the huge eaters of fatty meat deepened the prejudice, especially since they rarely washed their bodies, even after long sea voyages, whereas civilized people naturally enjoyed a daily hot soak. Shocking behavior reinforced associations with the animals on which the hairy eaters fed. Failing to bow as well as to bathe, Westerners blustered and bragged, spitting into handkerchiefs and stuffing the unsanitary wetness back into their pockets. The strangers violated a hundred proprieties, often eating with their fingers and even expressing anger in public. Once fearful suspicion replaced the original Japanese hospitality, other attributes of the crude visitors served to confirm prejudices. On the observation that Western footwear had wooden heels, and a deduction that the wearers needed those novelties to prop themselves up, some Japanese posited that the alien feet had no heels of their own. Winning battles with such defectives would be simple. Tipping them over would leave them helpless on their backs. Dutchmen were seen to have coarse skin, oversized noses, and bulging eyes, really just like those of a dog, a scholar assured. Such evidence of inferiority served as confirmation of rumors that the red hairs lifted their legs for urination. They were also said to use their canine-like penises as lasciviously as the dogs to whom they were believed related in that particular too. Those low-bred beings, taught the standard explanation for the country's closing, had designs on Japan, 
good people took the menace for granted. A noted political thinker and Tokugawa policy advisor named Shonan Yokoi alluded to it in an 1849 appeal to wipe out the beast-like barbarians of the world. Although Europeans had seen the greater threat until recently, America's territorial and maritime expansion, knowledge of which had trickled in despite the isolation, began shifting the focus even before the black ships arrived. When they did, doom gripped most who heard of them steaming around the harbor, displaying their marksmanship and artillery practice. Whether or not the Commodore fired his cannon only in salute as he'd maintain, few Japanese perceived the stunning salvos as such. On July 10th, two days after the vessels were first spotted, an Edo physician recorded rumors running wild and agitation in people high and low. The Americans' untroubled advance beyond a hidden sandbank that supposedly closed Edo Bay to all foreign vessels was causing great tumult in the whole court. A well-educated diarist noted a general feeling of suddenly being thrown into the middle of a war, some fearing that bombardment would burn down the entire capital. An official notice prohibiting discussion of the foreign fleet kept it to a whisper for a day or so. But people on the street began exchanging gossip in loud voices from the evening of the 10th. Unable to suppress it, the government switched to assurance that Perry had come to offer tribute, which is how early paintings would depict him, a foreigner showing proper deference to Japanese officials. Some of the talk revealed ambivalence about the outside world. Intimidating as they were, the huge ship's builders and sailors obviously weren't stupid and simple, as the scholar had assured seven years earlier. The volume of chatter increased the following day, when the summer sun seemed to speed a furious sprouting of rumors. The same diarist, who evidently practiced Western, then called Dutch, medicine to high society, including government officials, noted the exception he was making to his policy of not satisfying his patients' curiosity about the West, because doing so would be a distraction from their treatment. In answer to their grim questions now, he sought to appraise them of Western power, with which he was acquainted because he also ran a highly unusual boarding school that made use of European materials. Why exactly had the Americans come? To see the emperor? To lease a Japanese island? Other prospects were mortifying. Everyone with the knowledge about the United States was hounded for information. By the evening of the first day, the extremely grave situation had deeply distressed even some in the shogun's court who hadn't interrupted their ordinary routine when the news initially arrived. Meanwhile, the price of rice soared and no fresh fish was delivered to the markets, presumably because fishermen didn't dare launch their boats. And the daimyo, barren-like lords of all the country's feudal domains, were warned to stand in readiness to meet an emergency. It was as if all of Edo was to be burnt to ashes at this very moment. Unquote. So, what is the emperor going to do? Well, there we run into a problem. See, while President Fillmore's letter is addressed to the emperor, the emperor and his imperial court aren't in Edo, they are in Kyoto. The emperor lives in seclusion and he sees almost no one. He is this distant, mythical figure who only has a ceremonial role. This would be like aliens landing in Canada and asking to see their leader, but insisting on delivering their message to the official head of state, the Queen of England. Normally, it would be up to the shogun to decide what to do, but at this particular moment, the shogun is deathly ill and the Japanese don't want to tell the Americans about any of this. 
Instead, the decision falls to a man named Abe Masahiro, the senior counselor in the shogun's council. But he doesn't have the authority to actually make any promises to the Americans. He consults with the other counselors, and on July 11th, just in time for Commodore Perry's deadline, Abe decides that there would be no harm in at least accepting the letter from President Fillmore. At the very least, that might buy the Japanese some breathing room to figure out what to do. So, Abe agrees to send two daimyos to meet with Perry, although he calls the daimyos princes, again making Perry feel more important, like he's meeting with some of the highest officials in the empire. And on July 14th, 1853, Commodore Perry goes ashore, and the Japanese delegation receives him. And both sides try to impress each other with pomp and circumstance and the implied threat of force. By now, there are thousands of armed samurai in the area around Edo Bay, and most of them are present for the ceremony. Perry, meanwhile, lands with his marines, all in dress uniforms with a military band. We have... A few first-hand descriptions of these negotiations from the people who were there. My favorite is from William Speeden, Jr. He was a young ship's mate on the Mississippi, one of Perry's ships, so he would have been around 15 years old at this time. And... He's one of the ones lucky enough not just to go ashore, but to sit in the room with a bunch of the senior officers. Here's what Speedon says in his diary. Quote, A few minutes after nine, four of the ship's boats, the launch, barge, first and second cutter, were manned and containing 50 men, Our band, the Marine Guard, and 16 officers, including the rider, left the ship and went alongside the Susquehanna with all the other boats of the squadron and all the persons armed and equipped. At half past nine, all the boats shoved off from the flagship and went ashore, where we were drawn up in line to receive the Commodore. When we landed, the Japanese, to the number of 6,000, were drawn up in lines along the borders of the bay. Their front files extended over a mile, and with their banners innumerable and blue and scarlet pennants, presented a most beautiful, with a warlike, appearance. The Japanese had made a wharf of some four yards in length, and about one in width of dirt, so that we could come easily to land without having to beach the boats as we would otherwise have been the case. The Commodore shoved off from the Susquehanna at ten minutes before ten, and was saluted by her with thirteen guns. The officers were drawn up on each side of the little wharf, and the men is spoken of above. Presently, a white boat with a broad pennant painted on each bow, or otherwise called the Commodore's Barge, was seen to near the shore, and in a few moments after, or at ten o'clock precisely, Three long and loud rolls of some half-dozen drums proclaimed that the great mogul had landed, and immediately the two bands struck up Hail Columbia. Really, it made the blood thrill in my veins to behold such an imposing and beautiful sight, and more so when I thought that even I was among the happy number. But lo, we landed, and after showing the respect due our superior, we fell in dividing the files of the marines and men, marched then all of us off to the house built for our reception. We had not far to walk. Arriving at this house, the officers went in, but the marines were drawn up in front to prevent an attack, although nothing of this sort was expected, but it was well to be prepared. The first room we entered was about twenty feet square. On each side, there were paintings on silk of birds and other things very roughly done. Around this room, on mats, 
with their hats on their laps, sat a dozen or so of old men, but still of some account, with their heads hung down, looking as if their last day had come. On one side of the room there was a large doorway hung all around with silk drapery. This doorway gave full view to a room about the size of the others, although much better ornamented. On one side were four large chairs intended for the Commodore and staff, who on entering took seats in them. On the other side were three chairs. One was occupied by the Prince of Idzu, first counselor of the Emperor. He was appointed by the Emperor to negotiate with us, and I have heard that he ranks the same as our Secretary of State. This person's appearance was very gloomy and downcast, and his expression seemed to say that this was great fun for us, but it was anything else for him. Next, a little to his left, sat the Prince of Iwami. He accompanied the Prince of Idzu, and on his right sat his interpreter. Besides this, there was another interpreter, who squatted down alongside a large box, very prettily lacquered, and which was intended to receive the box which contained the President's letter and the box containing the Commodore's powers. These two boxes were brought in the room by the Commodore's bodyguard, two Negroes, each standing six feet. The interpreter then jumped up, took the boxes from them, and placed them carefully on the lip of the large box. He then opened, and after seeing what was inside, closed them. He then took the cover off from the large box and placed inside it the two small ones. Then, replacing the cover, he passed around it a thick silk cord, which he tied on the top, and then squatted down as before. The Commodore then told the Prince, through Mr. Portman, our interpreter, who spoke to the interpreter who sat on the floor. He told the other interpreter, and by this rigmarole, the Commodore's message, which was as follows, reached the ears of the Prince, that, as he supposed it would take some time to give an answer to the letter, he would return again next spring to receive it, and that while we remained here he should survey the bay and endeavor to find a safe and commodious anchorage for his ships, as he would bring a good many more with him. The prince did not like this much, but nodded in assent. He also said that we would leave in a few days for China by way of Lu Chu, and that if they had any commissions he would be most happy to take them. He said that he had none but he hoped we would not make known to the Lu Chuans the proceedings of this day. Several other questions passed between them, which were unnecessary to give. After this, we bid the princes goodbye, and marched back to the landing place, accompanied by several of the mandarins, the bands playing the tune of the low black car. After getting into the boats, we proceeded to the respective ships, the governor and deputy governor of Uraga and the interpreters went on board the Susquehanna and went up in her as far as Oragawa, or Uraga, more frequently called. They witnessed for the first time the performance of the steam engine and were very much pleased at everything they saw. A few moments after twelve, we were ordered by the Commodore to get under way and proceed as far up as we went the other day, which we did. Unquote. So, Perry basically tells the Japanese that he'll be back in a year for their answer, and he'll be back with more ships. And if you're wondering about that bit with the multiple interpreters, uh, there are multiple interpreters because the American interpreter is translating from English to Dutch, and the Japanese interpreter is interpreting from Dutch to Japanese. So you can imagine how challenging these types of negotiations would be, even if the situation is not tense, just playing that game of whisper down the lane through multiple translators. Anyway, this evening, after delivering the president's letter to the shogun's representatives, or as far as he knows, the emperor's representatives, uh, Commodore Perry is cruising around Edo Bay with the mayor of Uraga and his deputy on board, 
showing them various aspects of the ship's design, trying to impress them with American technological prowess. But they also end up impressing him at some points. For example, he shows them a globe, not realizing quite how literate these people are. He wants to impress them by showing them, you know, here is Japan and here's the United States. And, you know, the mayor of Uraga says something like, oh, yes, and, and here's Panama. I, I hear you're building a railroad there. How's it going? And the U.S. has indeed just started building a railroad in Panama. So it becomes pretty clear to Perry that Despite Japan's isolation, uh, the people are educated and well-informed about world affairs. So there's some mutual admiration and respect going on here. And before departing, Commodore Perry gives the mayor some heirloom seeds as a gift. And a couple days later, the American ships steam away. Now, at this point, if you are Abe Masahiro, you are probably heaving an enormous sigh of relief. The Americans have gone. They're not going to be back till spring. Let the shogun recover and deal with this. But Abe Masahiro is not out of the woods yet. See, only a few days after the American ships leave, the shogun, Tokugawa Ieyoshi, dies, and his son Tokugawa Iesada becomes the new shogun. But Iesada is sickly, and he lives in seclusion. Some historians think he may have had cerebral palsy, so he can't really run the country. And that task falls back on his council, and Abe Masahiro is still the senior counselor. There's no getting around it. He's going to have to decide how to respond to this American offer. And he's going to need to do it within the year. There are a couple of things that compromise Abe's position. To begin with, the Dutch had actually sent a warning to the Japanese a year earlier, telling them about the coming American expedition. This warning had been secret, known only to a few senior people, but Abe and the Shogun had chosen to ignore it. Now, accurate rumors of this Dutch warning are on every street corner. And remember, this is a literate society, so you have printed pamphlets all over Japan making fun of the government. This is bad news. Remember, the shogunate is a military regime. Its entire claim to legitimacy is that it has kept the peace for 250 years. Now the people find out that the shogun and the council knew about the American ships and decided not to do anything in advance. What good is this feudal warrior class if it's not going to fulfill its purpose. In the aftermath of Perry's visit, Abe commits another unforced error. As we've already discussed, this issue of foreign trade is controversial in Japanese politics, and Abe wants whatever decision the council makes to be seen as legitimate. If he's seen as imposing his will, no matter what he does, he fears that some daimyos will get upset and they might even revolt, which could be disastrous for Japan at a time when it desperately needs to remain united. So Abe decides to poll the daimyos. This has never been done before. And he sends out a message to all 300 of Japan's leading families, hoping to find a consensus. Instead, he finds the exact opposite. 
only 61 daimyos even bother to respond. 19 are in favor of opening to American trade, 19 are against, and 7 are in favor of a temporary trade agreement. 16 others don't have an opinion one way or the other, and of course the other 239 daimyos don't even bother to respond. So there's no consensus. And even worse, Abe has made the council and the shogun look weak when they needed to look strong. His instincts are wrong when it comes to imposing the shogun's will. Remember Tokugawa Ieyasu, the guy who founded the Tokugawa shogunate? He didn't do opinion polls or hold a vote. He imposed his will. A shogun is supposed to be strong, and this weakness further undermines the government's authority. The one thing all of the daimyos can agree on is bolstering Japan's defensive capabilities. So Abe and the council rescind the law against building ocean-going vessels. And the Japanese actually have blueprints they've purchased from the Dutch, and some of the daimyos have been experimenting with ocean-going craft in secret. So some of the work begins before the year is even out. Now these first Japanese ocean-going ships in centuries are going to be relatively small, and they're going to be obsolete even by the time they're completed, but they will represent the beginnings of a Japanese navy that's going to grow very quickly. For now, though, they are not going to be of much immediate use. And to make matters worse, it's not just Americans showing up. Shortly after Perry's expedition leaves, a Russian delegation arrives in Nagasaki, and Abe has to talk them into leaving with vague promises of future negotiations. And then Commodore Matthew Perry pulls a fast one on everybody. Since he left Japan, British and French diplomats have said that they intend to send delegations of their own alongside his return delegation to make sure the Americans don't get any concessions that the European powers don't get. So instead of waiting until spring as planned, Commodore Perry goes back to Japan in late winter without any European delegates, and he arrives in Edo Bay on July 13, 1854. And as promised, he's come with more ships, this time with eight instead of four. And this time around, the negotiations are more extended. At the first time Commodore Perry goes to Japan, it's really first negotiating over whether there will even be negotiations, and then delivering a letter. And now there are actual conversations going on, and Perry and his delegation remain in Edo Bay for over six weeks, negotiating with Abe Masahiro's delegates. And after these deliberations, Perry gets almost everything the U.S. had wanted. The Japanese government guarantees the safety of shipwrecked American sailors, and agrees to open two ports to American ships, one on Edo Bay and one in Hokkaido. Most importantly, American merchants won't be restricted to a tiny island like the Dutch merchants. They'll have free reign to go as far as seven miles inland, something no non-Japanese has done in more than 200 years. This gives the U.S. more trading rights with Japan than any other country. But trade is only part of the equation. 
Here we see two peoples, totally alien to each other, trying to understand each other's society. Our young ship's mate, William Speeden Jr., gives us an interesting example of one such interaction. A sailor on one of the ships had been in a bar fight in Hong Kong and has just now died of his injuries. And despite the Japanese prohibition on Christianity, Commodore Perry insists on giving him a Christian burial, and surprisingly, the Japanese officials agree. And Speeden writes about what happens when the burial party comes ashore. Quote, They landed at a spot designated, a quarter of a mile south of the landing place of yesterday and in front of this village, the whole shore being lined with villagers come down to gaze. The mayor of Uraga, interpreter, etc., received them there. All had expected that on their seeing the chaplain in his official costume and first knowing there was a Christian minister on their shore and among them, that there would be a recoil and that they would shrink from him as from something poisonous. But there was no such thing. On the contrary, they came up successively and gave him their hand for a shake. They have learned one salutation and seem to be fond of it, and the interpreter, pointing to the chaplain's prayer book, asked if it was for ceremonies over the dead, and smiled as before when he told him that it was. The marines were now put into line, and received the body with presented arms, after which the procession was formed and moved on. They, six marines with muskets muffled down and fife playing dead march, the chaplain, the coffin borne by four marines, Captain Stack, and Dr. Lina, hospital steward, and six or eight sailors. Their way laid through the village, and the occasion seemed to create quite a holiday among the Japanese. Everybody, men, women, and children, running and gaining good places for seeing, and squatting down on the ground till the funeral passed, when they would run and gain another place for observations if they could. The street, however, along which their road was laid, was kept entirely clear, and at intervals they noticed fresh boards stuck up with inscriptions, probably to warn people from intruding on their way. But the people, even women and children, showed no fear, nor any hesitation in going near them, or in being seen themselves, and some stores which they passed were kept open as usual. The chaplain was often pointed out, being doubtless recognized by his book and gown as the clergyman of the party. But it was without any exhibition of displeasure on their countenance, but as they would look at any other curiosity. At the further edge of the village, on a wooded hill at their left was a temple with two different flights of steps leading up to it, and ornamental gateways below. Through the further of these gateways, they now saw a Buddhist priest in his officiating costume emerge and perceived that he took his way towards some fresh earth, the grave, a little beyond. The Japanese had selected for the internment a very pretty spot, about a hundred yards from the village, and closely adjoining an old burying ground of their own. They found the Buddhist priest seated there, but he attempted no interference with their religious ceremonies, which the chaplain commenced, all uncovering, as they approached the grave. The scene at this time was an exceedingly interesting one, even apart from its being the first breaking through of the Japanese settled opugnation to Christianity. The hills here formed a semicircular sweep, and at one end of the semicircle they were standing. At the opposite end on the heights above was the Buddhist temple. The sides of these hills and the whole sweep of the crest was covered with people, quiet and attentive spectators of what was going on. Close to our officers stood the Japanese officials. Just below the grave the Marines were drawn up in line, and by their side on a mat sat the old Buddhist priest with a little table before him, on which were a number of papers, etc., with incense burning in their midst. 
The Japanese were quiet and attentive, while the chaplain went through the usual service for the solemn burial of the dead. Then the Marines fired three volleys over the grave. As the first volley was given, there was a half-shout on the hills around, a kind of boyish glee among the multitudes, who were computed by our officers at about two thousand. While they were filling up the grave, our officers asked permission to examine the Japanese burying ground, which the officials readily gave, the interpreter also going with them and explaining the several parts. Against the side of the hill is a range of sculptured stones, which he said were their gods. Some had bas-relief figures like human beings on them. Across the space were lines of small headstones, some of these were also with human figures sculptured in bas-relief on their front, others with inscriptions. These were commemorative of individuals buried below, and when one of the officers observed to the interpreter that the space for each body was very small, he replied that the dead were buried in a sitting posture. The officers then went to the Buddhist priest, a venerable-looking man of about seventy-five years of age, who was very friendly and showed them his rosary. Half of the beads in were glass and half wood, and also his book. The interpreter opened the papers and showed them their contents, and stated that the Buddhist had come there as a compliment to Mr. Williams, Williams having been the name of the deceased. On the little table, in addition to the incense box and some rolls of unknown materials and paper, were also a bowl of cooked rice, a covered vessel of sake, and a small gong. The priest now commenced his ceremonies, sometimes touching his gong, sometimes stirring the sake, while he thumbed his beads, and then, muffling his hands in his robe and bowing his head, he read some prayers in a low, unintelligible voice. His outer garment was a poncho of very rich brocade silk, covered with fanciful figures. After putting a head and footboard to the grave with inscription and covering it in the usual manner, our officers and men left the Buddhist priest still engaged at his ceremonies and set out on their return, the crowds gathering around as before and all very civil and polite. So with drum and fife playing, they returned to our boats and then to the ship. Unquote. For the Americans in this scene, this is one fascinating exchange with one foreign culture. From the Japanese perspective, though, this is the first of many interactions, and this American trade is just the first crack in the dam. Within a couple of years, the Japanese will sign similar agreements with the British, the French, and the Russians, and the trickle of foreign contact grows into a torrent. They're interacting with all kinds of different cultures. And like I keep saying, the Japanese of this time are a literate people. Ideas from all over the world start flowing through society along with those European goods. And these ideas exacerbate old tensions within society. In particular, the old feudal social order is going to face a reckoning. See, I talked earlier about the fact that Japan in this time period has something resembling a caste system. But what I didn't mention is that the lowest rung in this caste system is the merchant class, the people who deal with money. And in this new, more mercantile-oriented Japan, those people are going to have something to say. And just like in other societies, like the Dutch Republic, where merchants become more powerful than their supposed overlords, this creates an imbalance in society 
and its imbalance that needs to be redressed. That redress is called the Meiji Restoration. And it won't be just the merchant class that has something to say. The samurai class, that large cast of soldiers, will be willing to fight to the death to retain their privileges. But as usual, I've gone on for way longer than I meant to. So we'll talk about the rest of the story in the next episode. Hi, this is J.P. Bristow, host of the Russian Empire History Podcast, a podcast about the history of all the peoples of the Russian Empire. What do you think about when you think of Russians? Do you think of Muslims or Buddhists? Did you know that over 140 languages have some kind of official status in the Russian Federation today? Do you think that all Russians are white? The Russian Empire was born where the Slavs from the northern forests met the peoples of the steppe. Less than half the population of the empire was ethnically Russian. And even in the Russian Federation today, ethnic Russians are only slightly over 70%. The history of the Russian Empire is the history of Tatars, Jews, Bashkirs, Turkmen, Armenians, Greeks and Kazakhs, as well as Russians, and reflects its position between Europe and Asia, and a heritage that draws on many sources, as well as its history of colonialism, which is still to play out. The histories of these people are intertwined, and none of them can be fully told without each other. The Russian Empire History Podcast looks at the history of all these peoples, tracing the origins and traditions that have contributed to their modern identities. If you'd like to see the bigger picture of the biggest country on earth. Join me at the Russian Empire History Podcast.com and on all good podcast platforms. Guess who? It's me again, Dan. And I'm here just to tell you about a few things we're doing to expand the channel here at Relevant History. The first thing that we're doing is a series called Dan's War College. This is a series of exclusive videos from yours truly detailing various military battles and tactics in history and breaking down how they worked in a little more detail than we do here on the main show. If you're interested in that, it is a Patreon exclusive. The link for the relevant history Patreon is in the description and the monthly fee for the subscription is $5. By the way, with that, you also get access to a private Discord chat room with yours truly. And yes, I take requests for those Patreon videos. Of course, not everybody is able to or wants to contribute financially, and that's just fine. I'm glad you're listening. But if you enjoy the show, why not share it with a friend? Help grow the audience and share something you love with somebody who might enjoy it. Also, it never hurts to leave a review. People are more likely to listen if they see a show with a bunch of reviews, particularly good ones. But eh, if you hated the show, go ahead and leave a review saying that, too. Tell me why you didn't like it. Alternatively, you could just reach out to me on Twitter at Dan Toller Podcast, or on Facebook at facebook.com slash Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan T-O-L-E-R Podcast. You can also reach me at Dan Toller Podcast at gmail.com if you think that I've made an error in one of the episodes or you just wanted to say hello. Finally, to find all of my episodes with links to all the various subscription services and podcast feeds as well as my blog which I have not updated in ages but eh, you never know you can find all of that at dantollerpodcast.com that's dan t o l e r podcast.com thanks for listening